at this session of the nanotechnology for neuroscience. And um, in the past one and a half days, we actually had the uh, effects of the nanoparticles in the toxicological aspects, as this is a nanotoxicology conference. But now, uh, today, starting from uh, morning, we are going for the bright side of the nanoparticles, although we have to take care of their actions through the body. So it's really nice to be here after Antalya. I hope uh, some of you already been to Antalya meeting. And uh, I would like to thank to all the local organizers for this nice conference, and they made it. I know how it feels that how much pressure they had. So now uh, we have four speakers in that session, and afterwards we'll go on with a discussion. I hope everybody would contribute a little bit about that. Our first speaker is Professor Dr. Hari Sharma. He is a PhD in neuroscience, and he did it in Banaras Hindu University in 1982, and Dr. Medical Science of Uppsala University, and he did it in 1999, and he's the Director of Research Experimental Center, Nervous System Injury and Repair, and University of Hospital Uppsala University, and he's a Professor of Neurobiology, docent in Neuroanatomy, and is currently affiliated with Department of Surgical Sciences, Division of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care Medicine, Uppsala University, Sweden. Thank you very much, please. Thank you very much for the honor, and I am grateful to Engin, who invited me here. And this is my first congress to nanotoxicology. I will speak on neurotoxicological aspects. And as you can see, that uh, this is uh, supported by various organizations, and especially Air Force Research Laboratory, and Swedish government, Swedish Research Chemical Foundation, and Kamal University. So, uh, there are two different aspects we are thinking about. I am involved in this uh, research since 2004. And the aspect is what nanoparticles are doing, whether they are neurotoxic or they are also used for drug delivery. So, we are working on both aspects of these in using animal models. And I have to say that whatever I am speaking here is my personal views and opinion. It has nothing to do with any organizations I'm working with. I was interested in the blood and barrier because this is a special part of the nervous system and drugs are not going to the brain in disease conditions. So my question was at that time, why people have disease? And we focused our research that many kinds of stressors opens the barrier. So this is also good or bad. In neuroscience research, still people think about neurons. And even we know that glial cells and even endothelial cells are much more higher in number than neurons. So our research was focused on trying to maintain the homeostasis using microvascular uh, leakage or endothelial cells as well and glial cells. Here we try to summarize that in all normal conditions, the blood brain barrier is quite normal. But in all neurological diseases, it is impaired or broken down. The good point is that there are various receptors present on the endothelial cells, and that can be modulated using drugs. <coughs> this is one example that uh, the blood brain barrier uh, lies between the tight junctions of the two endothelial cells, and this is lanthanum, 12 angstrom in diameter is stopped there. So that is the anatomical site of the barrier. I am basically a neuropathologist trainer under Ingve Olson at Uppsala University. And then I did some research at Humboldt Foundation with Dr. Sarvas Navarao, he is a uh, leader of uh, electron microscopy. So our hypothesis is that any kind of CNS insert opens the blood brain barrier, making many cellular expressions leading to cell death. So now we are fitting this nanoparticles in this program paradigm and also try to see drug delivery, how it can affect. Since we are working with uh, US Air Force Research Laboratory and also uh, Chinese military organizations, uh, we are concerned about uh, the exposure of different kinds of hazards to our soldiers. 
And this is a situation when people are, uh, our soldiers are placed in different areas, including, for example, Middle East, where they are exposed to silica every day. And they live in this kind of conditions, missile explosion, gunpowder, they are breathing different kinds of, uh, you know, uh, nanoparticles around. And these are the situation, dust storm, our soldiers are facing almost every day. This is another five pictures. And these are the common situations in a battlefield. So my point is that when injury is done to these soldiers at, in the battlefield, it is quite understandable that the pathophysiology of uh, brain trauma may not be similar as we have in a mm, normal civilian population where there is no much pollution. So this was the idea. We must uh, consider ourselves to modulate the drug therapy in those situations to make uh, rather good development. So this is suggested in a book and since we work with um, uh, USFDA and he is Dr. Uh, William Slicker, he is the director of uh, National Council of Toxic, uh, Center of Toxicological Research in Jefferson, we did some experiments there and due to lack of time I am only focusing on few aspects. The one example is that all animal experiments are done in healthy animals and of course under anesthesia. So what is happening, if you give any drug treatment to those, I mean, they, we are not doing justice to the human cases. Of course, we cannot produce animal models uh, very similar to human because uh, in human situations, we don't give anesthesia, the trauma can occur. But anyway, but what we forget, that if these uh, human beings, they have cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, and if they get brain injury, it is entirely a different situation than the healthy animals. So, uh, since 2006, we have started experiments in different kind of aspects. So here, uh, we understood that if animals are hypertensive and then they were subjected to any kind of exposure, the results will be different. So what we did, we exposed animals to uh, silica dust. And I can also tell you that small changes in the environment can also affect the brain pathology. So we, we did at high ambient temperature, 33 degrees Celsius and also we subjected to uh, some mild stress like immobilization. I can only tell you here that uh, we have studied neuronal damages in uh, different areas of brain, cortex, hippocampus, striatum, thalamus, etc. And there are different conditions. The result is that hypertension at normal 21 degrees Celsius in animals when they are exposed to silica dust, they Silica dust induced pathology is exacerbated. But when it is combined with immobilization stress, it is much more exacerbated uh, from the normal cases. And even exposure to 33 degrees centigrade is much worse. I can show you some example here. So you can see here uh, the hypertension to kidney 1 kg, SiO2 at 21 degrees Celsius, and here is 33. You can see the cortical damages are much more extensive, and these are at normal conditions no silica was given. Then we tried to understand the mechanisms and in a nutshell we tried several things. The other aspect, we blocked this by injecting TNF alpha antibodies delivered through uh, titanium nanowire and you can see that this expression of renitic oxide synthase was reduced because we believe that uh, uh, this free radical damage could be one of the important parts. So both things are happening. Dust exposure, exacerbate brain injury, and nano delivered antibodies were better. What happens to diabetes? This is an example I can tell you that uh, animals were made diabetic by uh, streptojotosine. They were given silica exposure, and you can see we have extensive leakage to the blood barrier and damage as compared to silica and saline only, and as compared to diabetes. We also studied neuronal changes and you can see that diabetes with silica exposure, they have much more devastating damages in the brain as compared to the other conditions. We also examined that electron microscopy and the most important part is myelin vesiculation is most prominent when silica uh, dust was exposed to the uh, animals with diabetes. So my point is that minor changes in the environment or disease can influence brain pathology in presence of nanoparticles. This is what we did in uh, USFDA. 
We published a book, uh, Progress in Brain Research, in 2009 to make people aware that these are really difficult problems and we must understand why developing uh, strategies for drug development. This is uh, Alan Shikanover. We are working on some kinds of ubiquitin expression after a nanoparticle uh, exposure and we find upregulation of ubiquitin in different areas of the brain. One paper was published uh, in 2015 in Molecular Neurobiology. So my point is that there are two aspects. I showed nanopathology, but nanodrugs are delivered to uh, cure many kinds of diseases. So what is about nanomedicine? The basic idea at the moment is that, that if we deliver the drug, any drug for example, using nanotechnology, it is much more effective than the parent compound. What is not done so much that people are using different kinds of nano labeling or nano formulation. The toxicity in vivo is not well examined. So this other part we are examining in our lab and we believe that uh, according to literature that nano formulations could be widespread in the brain but nano toxicity is very less examined. <coughs> the other question remains people are using different kinds of nanoparticles, whether all, all kinds of nanoparticles or nanoformulation are equally effective. So these are the questions that we have no answer at the moment, at least in our hand, and we are working to find out. The another problem in military is sleep deprivation. And then we studied sleep deprivation is another example with or without presence of nanoparticles. So what happened? In the battlefield, our soldiers had to sleep in these circumstances. This is a file picture taken from military. As you can see that this is their grade and as less amount of sleep reduces or deteriorates even normal function of our soldiers. I can cite another example. Here is the example that you can see sleep, sleep deprivation up to 72 hours, simple mathematical function has deteriorated. So something is happening to their mental function, whether it is hormonal or whether it is any kind of fatigue. This is another example, 4, 7, 6 hours. You can see that 4 hours at sleep has much more adverse effect. So what we did, we produced animal model of sleep deprivation. Uh, this is a well-known model. And we did two kinds of experiments. We also uh, exposed to them nanoparticles, in this case, copper and silver. You can see here, 72 hours of sleep deprivation produces much more adverse effect. And when we combine with copper nanoparticles or silver nanoparticles of the same size, the situation is much more adverse. Even the same size of copper and silver, silver has much more damaging effects. So the point is that even nanoparticle toxicity has increased uh, uh, neuronal damage. Then there are, we tried different kinds of drugs in sleep deprivation is the problem of serotonin. We have used condensatron, this is a 5 ST3 uh, receptor antagonist. And you can see here that uh, 2 milligram was able up to 72 hours, uh, sorry, 48 hours, good uh, neuroprotection. But it is much more better when we have delivered through titanium nanowire uh, drug. So this suggests that sleep deprivation alone is damaging the brain and nanoparticle addition has much more worse effect. What is happening on traumatic brain injury in these sleep derived, depri uh, deprived souls? That was another investigation and we used closed head injury model. Of course they are in animal and they were anesthetized. So what is happening in closed head injury that you have the counter coup mechanisms. So the other side that was not damaged is much more damaging. So here Injury was done on right side, but there is much more damage in left side, like clinical situations. We also tested electron microscopically, and we see that uninjured side in closed head injury is much more damaged. We also tried temperature, but I am uh, not going in details. If the same injury was done at 34 degrees Celsius or 5 degrees Celsius, cold and hot both were damaging in such situations. This is just an example, leakage of blood brain barrier was much more higher in uh, many injured animals where they were sleep deprived for 72 hours. 
So now I am talking about something uh, nanomedicine part and I can tell you we are using titanium nanowires. Actually this was discovered by Dr. Pudong Yong but he is doing for electronics. This is the titanium dioxide nanowires. My friends are doing in Arkansas Faithville, Dr. Ryan Tian, he has a US patent on that. And this is Dr. Ryan Tian and this is Dr. Wang. They have uh, this US patent and we are using uh, work in collaboration. And since these are very expensive, at that time uh, the former governor of Arkansas was helping us a lot. So I told you that brain injury is very complex and no single chemical compound or drug could be used to attenuate all the pathological changes. So it must be a multimodal drug having multimodal functions. So there is one drug called cerebralizin and it is manufactured in Austria. It has different combination of neurotrophic factors and active peptide fragments. So what we did, we applied this drug using nano delivery and 72 hours uh, sleep deprived of traumatic injury, we can see that nano-delivered cerebralizin has much more neuroprotective effects than the drug alone. Uh, I have pleasure to tell that uh, head injury after sleep deprived uh, animals, when it was given in presence of nanowire alpha stimula uh, melanocyte stimulating hormone, that was the innovation presented by my wife to the National Innovation Summit, it got top 15% of technological award and we are happy that of course we are going in the right direction. To test our hypothesis again that uh, we are doing right, we have used another kind of drug. I told that uh, whether nano delivered drug of any kind can be good, that is I am coming to this point. There is a Chinese drug uh, called NBP and it is Chinese uh, celery. Here. I am doing it together with uh, Dr. Uh, Fung in the military hospital of Shijia Zhuang. And this is a very old Chinese traditional um, uh, plant. The seeds were extracted for this drug and they have different kinds of effects. Some effects are going on for treating Alzheimer or stress. We used it in a traumatic brain injury and also applied nanowire uh, treatment. You can see here that nanowire delivery of uh, MDP, even less doses, can have much better effect as compared to the same drug, even 60 milligram. And these are just an example that the blood-brain barrier changes were much higher and brain edema was also higher. When we have given uh, this uh, drug, you can see the scales are very lower, but uh, the nanowire therapy has much more strong uh, neuroprotection as compared to the drug alone. <laughs> So we can say that uh, the drug efficacy can be enhanced using nano formulation up to certain limitation because we are not testing for one month or uh, six months after. These are still acute experiments. Briefly, I, I can show you some examples on spinal cord injury because if things are working in brain injury, it should be similar in spinal cord injury as well. And these are the normal situations where our soldiers are injured, largely in spinal cord injury. We developed a model in which the uh, dorsal bone of the spine cord was uh, leashed and unilaterally. The idea is that we wanted to study uh, neuroprotective effects in the ipsilateral and contralateral side. So we did not uh, drop the weight of, over the spine cord because that can damage both sides. And here again, silica exposure. Silica exposure has much more uh, edema and expansion as compared to the normal cases. And here you can see that silica exposure, almost total loss of the tissue here edema formation was higher as compared to the saline treated spinal cord. Now the question comes, what kind of drugs we can use uh, for nano delivery to alleviate all kinds of things? Do we label any drug and it can have better effects? Probably the answer is not. Here, this is the analysis showed. We have used four different kinds of drugs. I cannot take the name because there are still uh, this company profile secret. So we have used four different kinds of drugs and nano delivered in identical way in a spinal cord injury. And what you can see here that uh, this is, this is uh, the area of the untreated where the maximum damages can occur and these are the maximum neuroprotection you can see. There is one drug particularly 
it's doing much more better here is this side, but in all the other drugs are in between. So my point is that you cannot make a bad drug good just delivering using nanoparticles or nano -delivery. The drug should be good. Then you can get a little better benefit when it is delivered using nanoparticles. And this is the example. The good drug is was given here. And you can see that myelin vesiculation is least as compared to the untreated group here. Now in last uh, few minutes, I will tell you the role of nanomedicine in Alzheimer's disease. And most of you are very aware that uh, this, Mr. Alzheimer has discovered this in 1902 and that's why the disease is based on his name. This is an example that how the brain could be different as compared to the control after Alzheimer. And all aspects of all components of the CNS means glial cells, um, and microglia, endothelial cells, all are affected, not only neurons. So the idea is that what we can do using nanowire techniques. There are people use silica nanowires and this is million primer stem cells. They found that when they are leveled on silica, uh, grown on silica nanowires, they can live longer in vivo and have less toxic effects. And in 2013, I was given 20% top technology award. My wife got 15%, I'm jealous. Anyway, so uh, this was on the cerebralizing uh, nanowire for chronic neuropathic pain. And then there was a lot of discussion on uh, cerebralizing. So we produced Alzheimer in animal model by injecting amyloid beta protein. There are standard uh, methods to do that. And we measured amyloid beta here. But you can see that cerebralizin was given here. It, it is able to reduce this A beta accumulation, but the nanowire cerebralizin is much more effective. There are also reports about tau protein that is increased in both cerebralized uh, uh, CSF and also in the brain. And what you can see here that nanowire cerebralizin has the best effect in reducing the tau accumulation. Then we went on, uh, I am a neuropathologist, so I, I see uh, at the light electron microscopy, this albumin leakage is much more reduced by titanium nanowire cerebralizin, so as the astrocytic reactions, and neurons were much more preserved. We always confirm our light microscopic observations at electron microscopy, so that we are not making any mistakes. And you can see here that myelin vesiculation in the cortex was significantly reduced, not prevented, by nanowire cerebralizing application in this model. We also used a combination of median bandwidth stem cells, nanowire and cerebralizing, and we are able to reduce uh, brain pathology in this animal model. Then, this is Dr. Harry Kyoto. Uh, and he's another Nobel Prize uh, winner. So we discussed about some aspects of um, experiments at uh, high altitude and low altitude. What is the effect? Low altitude, we are not able to do any successful experiments so far, but I, I can tell you some of the, uh, some basic results. And again, I'm coming back to this question that if nano delivery as a tool is important or the drug is and here is my friend in um, Italy, Dr. Giovanni Tosi. He leveled cerebralizin in PLGA model. And we can see that PLGA lo loaded cerebralizin is quite effective and releases the drug for a long time. Again, in the Alzheimer model that I showed you, the point is that we compared the blood one barrier leakage and TiO2 delivered cerebralizin and PLGA delivered cerebralizin, you can see that it's still under similar doses, identical doses, this nanowire cerebralizin is a little bit better. I don't know the real. I'm not going to discuss about other uh, situations because there are different factors that can affect the brain pathology. Regarding clinical cases, so far we have not been able to translate the basic research to the animal and to the human cases and the basic reason is that it is very difficult to find two identical clinical cases. 
Here is Dr. Shelley and he developed different kind of CRN molecules. We are using some of his uh, molecules to nano wiring and try to see whether we can have better neuroprotection in Alzheimer's disease. In the last leg of my talk, I can tell you if one method works in one model, it should work in another model too. So, one of my colleagues in Bilbao, Spain, she did a PhD on uh, Parkinson's disease and your protection. And as you can see that uh, this, is, this is MPTP model of where the traction hydro hydroxylase is, uh, immune activity is completely degraded. And then we have leveled cerebralizin in titanate nanosphere. And this is done by uh, our colleague in uh, University of Arkansas Fairfield, Dr. Asia. She's a PhD student working on that. And she did, she leveled cerebralizin in hollow titanate uh, nanospheres. And you can see that it is slow release and it can be even further. So long time release of cerebralizin occur. And this is uh, the model of um, Parkinson's disease in rats. And this was used six hydroxy dopamine induced uh, degeneration of dioxin hydroxylase. You can see that in this environment alone was better than control. Cerebralizin was also a little bit better than control. But when cerebralizin nanowire given with enriched environment, we have the best result so far in our hand. And this is the subject of a doctoral thesis uh, of Catalina. Of course, these are very expensive experiments and we need lots of government support. At that time, uh, the former Prime Minister of Sweden, Goran Persson, was very supportive to us. And I briefly conclude my talk by showing some example of high altitude. These are from military files, nothing new. So you can see our soldiers are placed at very high altitude mountains as well. We, we developed uh, animal model uh, for hyperbaric oxygen and in chambers. And what we can see that even uh, nanowires delivery of cerebralizing has some better effect than the cerebralizing alone. So at the moment, what we can sum up? I think we believe that nanomedicine helps in enhancing the basic effects of the drugs. And uh, what is important for us to understand is uh, neurotoxicology of the vehicle. In our hand, titanium oxide nanowires up to five days do not produce any toxic effect in the brain so far in mice and rats. That's why we are using it. We have some uh, future potential, we are working on that, and in this case, we try to contain comorbidity factor influence, disease and neuropharmacology. Because in humans, uh, when they are injured or get any disease, they have multiple kind of other disease as well. So the same drug cannot work, and this is the aspect we are working together with our partners in different parts of the world. These are our sponsors, and we have some grant support from various organizations. I'm not taking time to read it. Our collaborators, and our laboratory is best at Uppsala University. And I thank you very much for your time. Yes, please. I'm afraid we have not tested that. Okay. So I can I can't tell you at the moment. Okay. So this is a of peptides. Yes, this is uh, the drug is a mixture of uh, different kinds of neurotrophic factors, brain derived neurotrophic factor, glia derived neurotrophic factor, and the filial cell derived neurotrophic factors in particular amount, and also some peptide fragments. So uh, that are need to, uh, I mean, for your protection okay. and even neurogenesis. Okay, so that might be a role. I mean, uh, it's just inhibiting maybe the pathway. The drug company did not tell us. Okay. <laughs> But that's it. Yes. Uh, so in these uh, battlefield conditions, these soldiers they are exposed. Uh, they are exposed.